Britain are some of the finest gardens anywhere in the world. For me, it's about getting in amongst the wonderful plants that flourish in this country and sharing the passion of the people who tend them. However, there is another way to enjoy a garden. And that's to get up above it. I love ballooning because you get to see the world below in a whole new light. From up here, you get a real sense of how the garden sits in the landscape, how the terrain and the climate has shaped it. And I want you to share that experience with me. It's so early in the morning that I reckon most people around here are still asleep. But I can't resist picking up a few souvenir snaps. I'm heading to a county with some of the most stunning landscapes anywhere in the UK. Today we're in Northumberland, England's most northerly county. To the west lies Cumbria with its gentle fells and its hillsides, and to the north, the Scottish borders. Northumberland is Britain's most sparsely populated county, but it has huge historical importance. Over the years, Vikings invaded it, shipbuilding brought prosperity to it, and two nations fought bitterly over it. The history of the county is full of stories of battles between the English and the Scots, but I'm here for its gardens. Today, I'm visiting two gardens that in their time both saw dreams come true. One where a Victorian inventor was inspired by nature and changed the world. It's the simplicity of turning water into light. And the second, where one man's longing for a country retreat led to the creation of this tiny masterpiece. Couldn't be nicer, could it? Not a deal out to do. <laughs> and along the way, I'll be meeting the people lucky enough to look after these two very special places. <laughs> oh, the first garden I'm dropping in on is not just a wonder of the gardening world. It's pretty significant in the history of science too. Nearly 150 years ago, what happened in this house, Craig Side, transformed the way we power our homes. And the secret lies in the water that flows through the estate, because this was once the home of a very remarkable man indeed. From the air, you can see how large the estate of Cragside is. The hillsides are planted with conifers and rhododendrons. It has one of the largest rock gardens in Europe, and the formal terraces are planted with stunning Victorian bedding. And I can't wait to get down there. Of all the gardens I've visited, Cragside is one of the most dramatic. It's remote, over 30 miles from the nearest city, Newcastle. Its nearest town is Rothbury, and the house itself is nestled deep in the setting of forests and lakes. But although this countryside looks natural, it's actually a completely artificial landscape. Cragside, a Victorian period piece that zings with colour and history. Beautiful colour smeared across the landscape on a hill and fantastic trees maintaining traditions that are long gone, but not in this garden. History, colour and zing to excite any garden visitor. Cragside was the home of Victorian industrialist and inventor William Armstrong. Armstrong was born in Newcastle in 1810. After an early career as a solicitor, 
he followed his childhood dream and became an inventor. He came up with a design for the world's first hydraulic crane and developed an improved battlefield gun. He set up a factory employing thousands and in the process became one of the wealthiest men in the north of England. In an age of industrial innovation, Armstrong was a giant character, becoming the first engineer to take a seat in the House of Lords. He bought the land here to create a country retreat and he and his wife, Margaret, commissioned this unconventional mansion. And they set about creating an equally extraordinary garden. It covers four square kilometres and truly emphasises the drama of Cragside's location. They are the outsized boulders of the rock garden and the steep valley of rhododendrons and a formal garden with terraces, beds and borders. There's also a pinetum, or conifer collection, which contains trees from around the world, some of them over 140 years old. It's said that Lord and Lady Armstrong planted over seven million trees in the estate. Mind you, they did have 150 gardeners to help them. Today, I'm going to add one more tree to the collection. I'm heading down to the Pinetum to help plant Cragside's latest addition, a South African mountain cypress. I'm meeting Dale Stevens, who's worked here for 22 years and has been in charge of the garden since 2014. Hi, Dale. Hi, How Christine. Are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in a <laughs> super setting for it. It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. It's wonderful. So shall we drop this yeah, in? Yeah, let's just get this in, yeah. You're yeah. Just gonna... I'll just dig a small hole. So how did you get into gardening? Basically, I spent a lot of time at my grandparents' house. They had a, a small holding of um, two and a half acres, had pigs and right. uh, veg patch and all that kind of thing. So yeah. I got the bug, really, and then I saw, saw a little ad that um, was advertising uh, come and do traineeship at, at Cragside. Yeah. So I was on that placement for 11 months and then luckily a job came up. So I've been here 22 years now. Oh, goodness, <laughs> right. Well, and gradually worked my way up from basically the apprentice right yeah, through to, excellent. to what is the head gardener's position at the yeah, moment. So great. it's fantastic, fantastic place. Well, love, the, love it, love place, it. Absolutely. So what makes Cragstyle so special to you? I look around, really. Uh, it's a fantastic spot. Atmospheric, get to, as a horticulturalist, you get to play around with trees, plants, shrubs, you name it, things that are unusual, things you never see elsewhere. Yeah. And just working in this, it's absolutely... Yeah. To, to die for, you know, mm. really is. Yeah. Um, it's one of them places you sort of, you know you've sort of made it when you get here. This sapling won't become one of the giants of the Pinetum, but will grow into a pretty, medium-sized evergreen tree. Are you happy with that, Deb? I'm perfect, absolutely right, perfect. So, so um, you like to oh, get some of that back in there. Do you have a favourite place in the garden? Not one particular, no. It's, it's a combination, a little bit of everything. I yeah. like the piney that yeah. we're in at the moment. I like the, the rock garden and I also like the formal garden. Again, every bit has its own little uh, idiosyncrasies, you know, it, so it's, it's quite nice to sort of manage them in that, that sort of way. Yeah. We've only got a small team of gardeners. Yeah. Uh, there's four of us full time to look after approximately 40 acres. And how many volunteers? <laughs> Ten volunteers, three garden guides, right. one trainee and one seasonal gardener. Right, so they're busy. <laughs> to put it in perspective, um, the rock garden's four and a half acres. One person looks after four and a half acres. Right, and they work hard. <laughs> they do, yes, they work hard. yes, that's well, right. Talking about hard work, come on, let's go and put some more things come in. Come on then. <laughs> like lots of couples, Lord and Lady Armstrong split their gardening duties. She was in charge of the plants and he looked after the hard landscaping. In the grounds of the estate, he dammed several rivers, creating five lakes. All this water was to prove the inspiration for his greatest achievement generating the power to make Cragside the first house to be lit by electricity. Andrew Sawyer has worked at Cragside for over 30 years. Better than anyone, he knows the story of how Lord Armstrong's vision changed the modern world. His great dream really was water power and that was the essence of everything he did right from the start. By the time he bought Cragside, 
Armstrong had made a fortune from water power by inventing the world's first hydraulic crane. It revolutionised every ship dock, every railway. It meant that men weren't lifting things physically. It was all done by the power of water. After this success, his ambitions for using water power grew. He'd used every bit of technology that he'd both developed as an engineer and what was available at the time. He used this lake here at Tumbleton to run a hydraulic engine, which pumped 5,000 gallons of water to the house each day, which gave him the ability to run a passenger lift in the house so he didn't even have to walk up the stairs to go to bed. He even turned the meat in front of the kitchen fire with a water-powered rotisserie. He had an enclosed boiler system, which he meant he had hot and cold water throughout the house. It really was the standard of living that we have today, almost a century and a half ago. It was a bit like someone wanting all the latest gadgets today, and Armstrong had the money to buy every modern convenience. And when he heard his friend Joseph Swan had invented an electric light bulb, he had to have that for Cragside too. And so he invented the first ever domestic hydroelectric generator, once again powered by water from the estate. This is Lord Armstrong's original hydroelectric system. The water comes from the top lakes in the big blue pipe into the turbine. Uh, water revolves the turbine. Um, that turns the shaft that then revolves the generators and then the electricity is sent up to the house. Turbines were being used for all kinds of things, but he connected the dynamo to the water turbine to produce hydroelectricity. It's the simplicity of turning water into light. In time, the house switched to mains power, but visitors were always asking if the house was still lit by hydroelectricity. In January 2014, Andrew could finally answer yes when this wonderful Archimedes screw was installed. Once again, power was being generated from water at Cragside. It's a modern way of producing hydropower which still lights the house, which means we can still have our proudest boast. Cragside was the first house in the world to be lit by hydroelectricity, and it still is. The Debden burn that Armstrong Dam to create his lake still tumbles through the grounds close to the house. It's spanned by this beautiful footbridge, the Iron Bridge. From here, the path winds up to Cragside's formal gardens. This is where Lord and Lady Armstrong work together to transform a series of fields overlooking the valley into these three glorious terraces. In Armstrong's day, the top terrace would all have been glasshouses. Now only the walls remain, enclosing the estate's two fern collections. The clock on the tower would have rung at the beginning and end of the estate worker's day. On the middle terrace is the orchard house, home to exotic fruit trees in pots, peaches and apricots, lemons and limes. Each pot sits on a turntable which Armstrong designed so that the trees can revolve to catch as much sunlight as possible. At the foot of the garden, the lower terrace takes the form of an Italian-style loggia, also designed by Armstrong. The pool and fountain have recently been restored to the garden as they would have been when Lord and Lady Armstrong lived here. The entire formal garden is famed for its colourful flower borders. Here, the new Archimedes screw is being celebrated in a fabulously colourful way. Oh, hey, traditional carpet bedding. <laughs> oh, you don't um, often see it. No, this is one of our feature beds. It's keeping the skills alive, because obviously mm. this kind of thing's a dying art. Yeah, um, drawn that hand trimming then? Yes, yes, if you don't mind. Yeah, can, no, uh, I remember doing a, this on the parts <laughs> department. We'll have a go at this, yeah. 
If I work down here. Yeah, please. yeah, if you work down there, Christine, that'd be fantastic. So basically what we want is... Just trim it over. Just, yeah, yeah, just keep it nice and flat, keep the edges nice and crisp. That would be brilliant. Carpet bedding first became popular in the 19th century. It was widely fashionable in the new municipal gardens springing up around the country. The best plants for carpet bedding are low-growing, slow-growing and colourful. Echeveria and sedums are popular choices. When I first started working in Clitheroe's Parks Department, one of my first jobs was keeping bedding neat. Yeah, I used to spend hours and hours <laughs> and hours doing this. But it's not often that you see such an intricate display. How do these carpet beds fit into the overall garden? It was the fad, it was the fears, that's what they wanted. It's all about celebrating something. It's, it's, that's what carpet bedding's about. It's to celebrate, in, in a planting design, to celebrate something, anniversary, uh, coronation. Because it was a showpiece, it had to be absolutely pristine and perfect. And yeah. certainly in Armstrong's day, if it wasn't perfect, um, the head gardener would have come down on someone like a ton of bricks, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, Dale and his team put over 20,000 individual plants into these beds. Each year, they work to a different design, taking six weeks to plant it up. Do you raise the plants yourself? Yes, yes we do. Um, it works out a lot cheaper for us to do that. All the succulents, all these echeverias are all kept behind the scenes and they go, go to bed for the winter. So you're maintaining not only planting out, but the actual plant raising the and overwintering? Plant keeping, and, yes, yes. Right, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's nice, actually. To buy the plants in for these two beds, you're looking at somewhere in the region of £35,000. Yeah, and that's why it's not done that often these days, because the, the vast cost is yes, enormous. It's, it's a huge cost, yeah. The skills are disappearing from the old parks departments. Yeah. And it, it's nice that we're trying to keep that alive, nice that the National Trust is trying to keep that alive um, in the skills that they're trying to promote as well. Right, well, I think we could do with a cup of tea, couldn't we? I certainly think so, yes. Yeah. yes. So we'll, we'll come back to this later. Absolutely, I quite agree. <laughs> Brew time! <laughs> Dale and his colleagues are keeping the art of carpet bedding alive in the hills above Rothbury. But 30 miles from here, on the outskirts of Newcastle, sits a garden that's reviving uses for plants dating back 3,000 years. This is Dilston Physic Garden. The brains behind the garden is Elaine Perry. She's not a gardener or a botanist. She comes from a very different branch of science. She's a professor based at Newcastle University with a particular interest in conditions like Alzheimer's associated with memory loss. It became clear that we certainly weren't going to get a cure for Alzheimer's disease just like that. And I started to wonder if perhaps the plant world had something to offer. So we looked back hundreds of years through the archives and found that, yes, indeed, there were plants that were said to improve the memory, plants like sage and lemon balm. And of course, what's really exciting is that when you then take a look at that information and look at, for example, what chemicals the plants contain and what effects they have on you know, laboratory tests, you find that all that information that's been passed down is actually verified in terms of modern science. Elaine needed a garden to grow plants for her experiments and the Dilson Physic Garden was born. The first Physic Gardens were founded in medieval times. Elaine's garden follows the tradition stretching back over 500 years when, instead of popping pills, people would have found remedies in gardens and hedgerows. So your doctor was using plants, the old ladies in the village were using plants, the grandmothers were using plants. It was knowledge that was passed down from generations and people in a way self-medicated. They knew the plants, they knew how to prepare the extracts, when to take it, how much to take. There are over 800 different species of plants grown here now and a team of volunteers helps maintain the garden. They use the plants to make a range of products including herbal soaps and ointments. One of the volunteers, Dennis, is already feeling the benefit of what he's learned. I have got a problem with esophageal acid reflux 
and it's through Elaine that I've learnt about the wonderful healing properties of the herbs. I'm taking conventional medicine as well. This is not a substitute, but it is having a beneficial effect, it reducing uh, the acidity and the soreness, uh, which it, it can be a very serious medical condition. It's estimated that in some countries, 80% of people rely on herbal remedies as their first source of treatment. Perhaps in the future, Elaine's work with the plants in this garden will help prevent some of the world's most distressing diseases. But it's not just plants themselves that have therapeutic powers. Many people believe that gardening itself improves memory and can even help depression. And that's great news for tens of thousands of people who spend their time volunteering in the great houses and gardens around the UK. One of Cragside's volunteers is Jennifer Horner. She first caught the plant bug when she was a student, but in 1980 she moved from her native Newcastle to Switzerland. The house that we lived in in Switzerland was a beautiful house and had a quite a big garden around it but it was on top of a hill at about 800 meters which is probably about as high as Cheviot is here and in summer it was a beautiful alpine meadow if you allowed it but in winter it was just a bog covered with permafrost or snow <laughs> trying to plant anything it was just a waste of time so it was all very frustrating <laughs> After 27 years, Jennifer came back home to Northumberland and at last she could make a dream come true and have a proper garden. I would go to a nursery or into friends' gardens and just look at plants. I would look at plants every day if I had the chance. And I'd look at the plants and say, do I like you? And if I liked the plant, would it work in my garden? And, and if it did, then I would go and search for that particular plant. I liked alpines, so I had to collect alpines, and I like fuchsias, so I've got lots of different fuchsias. And then the, the tree was shady, so I thought, well, ferns will go there. And so I started collecting ferns of different shapes and sizes and colours to plant under the tree. There's probably about 200 different plants in the garden. That was at the last count. And I know there are at least 90 pots, because my husband has to water them. <laughs> But even 200 plants weren't enough for Jennifer. She wanted more. It was just one day I was visiting Cragside with a friend and one of the gardeners was working there and I, I went up to her and I said, do you have volunteers in the garden? And she kind of went, oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, that was it. It's just fantastic because I've now got two gardens. I've got my garden at home and then I can enjoy the bigger garden at Cragside. It's a bit like a, a dream come true. It's a, the icing on the cake to my retirement. At Cragside, Jennifer's taken on a project of her own, employing her love of ferns in reviving the two ferneries in the formal garden. Ferns were a huge craze with Victorians. You could buy special glass cabinets to show them off, while the rich could build grottos to house their collections. The basic structure of the fern hasn't evolved much over 140 million years. They're one of nature's greatest success stories. Ferns don't only grow well in shady areas, there's a fern for most situations, including sunny spots. In Armstrong's time, there were two ferneries at Cragside, but as ferns fell out of fashion, so they fell into disrepair. I've arranged to meet Jennifer in one of them, where she's been replanting. Hi, Jennifer. Hiya. Nice to see you. And you. What are you doing? I'm planting this fern in this uh, crevice here. It's a, a bare spot in the fernery. So. It'll look lovely in there. Yeah, I think it will. So how long have you known about Cragside? Well, Cragside itself I've known about um, since about the 1980s, but I'd, I'd heard of Armstrong when, when I was a child. How did you get involved with the ferns then? I got involved with the ferns because it was a bit neglected. 
Okay. And it was a bit sad. And my garden at home has an area where the only thing that would grow were ferns. Right. So I just started collecting loads of different ferns, and I knew about the ferns that could grow in different places. Mm. So I just gradually sort of winkled my way in, I suppose you could say. And what fascinates you about the place? Cragside is... Um, well, one, one of the visitors came by me the other day and they said, this is the most amazing place. It's full of corners and round every corner is something different. Mm. And it's true. You could just come to Cragside and visit the garden. Mm. And that's all, got lots of corners with lots of different things. Or you go into the estate and yes. you drive around and there's all sorts of amazing walks and drives and lakes. And then you go in the house and, well, it's full of Armstrong's amazing inventions. So a really fascinating man. Check that last yeah, bit off. Pack it in. Mm -hmm. and then, I mean, it needs a bit that's of water, right. doesn't it? We've Does got need a water. bit of water. Well, we can get that. Mm -hmm. So let's go and get some more plants. Okie doke. Jennifer is one of a team of ten volunteers working in the garden at Cragside. But whether volunteer or full-time staff, it's clear that everyone associated with the garden really loves this very special place. I mean, what surprises me about this garden is how it oozes history. You know, I mean, horticultural history, yes, yeah. I mean, you were commenting on earlier. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, the, the history goes all the way back through to, from 1870, just carrying that theme on. Obviously, Lady Armstrong was the, the horticulturalist. Armstrong was the man who put this kind of thing in these giant lumps of stone, these metal frames. That was his thing, the engineering side of it. Yeah. Lady Armstrong was the, the gardener, basically. But these aren't just stanchions, are they? No, no, these are drain pipes as well, the, the dual purpose detrimental to the building because the freezing winter and yeah. blow the building yeah. but yeah the, the the sort of gutters along the top and it all runs down into the, these runs down underneath and then the hollow underneath here a big tunnel runs out right the way out through into the parkland and it just takes the water away from this terrace take, to, takes the water away from the facious border behind right. it was all long thought out long before the pretty bits went in but jennifer you've been saying how fascinated you are with all the inventions that you got up to? Well, yes, I have been fascinated, especially when I first learned about Cragside and visited the house and saw all the amazing things in, inside of the house, mm. the, the equipment for the kitchen and the lift. And can you imagine working in a house in those days and having a lift to I get know. up and downstairs? With? And the fact that the house was one of the first houses to be electrified. And that's given me some food for thought. <laughs> In every wonderful garden I've visited during my balloon tour, I've left behind a little thank you. For my gift to Cragside, I'm thinking something with an industrial edge. Stephen Lunn is a local blacksmith turned artist, and he knows the garden well. When my children were growing up, that was our weekend event, was to go to Cragside. We're, we're a bit bad because we didn't go around the house, we actually adored the trees and the grounds and I cannot believe how them trees just grow so well. It's inspired myself actually to uh, plant my own tree arboretum and uh, some of my trees are from seeds from Cragside itself. It's not just Cragside's trees that's inspired him. Lord Armstrong was an inventor and I feel I'm an inventor as well. I invent designs so I, I feel quite infinity to Lord Armstrong and his grounds and gardening except mine's very small scale and his was uh, absolutely grand, amazing scale. Stephen's love of Cragside and his admiration for Lord Armstrong's inventiveness make him the perfect person to create something distinctive to donate to the garden as a souvenir of my visit. I'm going to leave the actual design up to him, but whatever it is, I'm sure it'll be worthy of Cragside and its first owner. Meanwhile, I'm getting back in my trusty basket and heading off on the next stage of my Northumberland adventure. About 40 miles north of Cragside, very close to the Scottish border, sits 
Holy Island. The island is cut off twice a day by the North Sea. Your timing has to be right to visit, but when you do, you see a rather spectacular garden and a fascinating castle. But I'm there to see its beautiful, tiny little special garden. This is the holy island of Lindisfarne. Just three miles long by a mile and a half wide, the island was first settled by monks in 635. Nowadays, over 600,000 visitors a year come to the island over the courseway or by boat. They visit for bird watching or to enjoy the beauty of the landscape. But I'm here to visit the castle and find out more about its special little garden. Lindisfarne Castle dates back to 1550. In 1902, the owner of Country Life magazine, Edward Hudson, asked his friend, the architect Edwin Lutyens, to transform it into a holiday home. Lutyens often worked with self-taught garden designer Gertrude Jekyll. He had designed her house, Munstead Wood, and they were great friends as well as collaborators. But when they came to work together on Linda's farm, the cost for renovating the castle itself spiralled. The plans to surround it with an ambitious garden of lakes and parkland were scaled back. Lutyens and Ducal ended up making a garden in what had been the castle's vegetable plot. But in this case, small really is beautiful. I've arranged to meet the lucky person who's in charge of looking after this tiny gem. Her name is Carol MacLeod. Hi, Carol. Hi, nice Christine. to meet you. And you. <laughs> God, you've got a lovely job here, haven't you? I have, thank you. So what do you know about Lutyens and Jekyll and this garden? Lutyens and Jekyll visited the castle. They were invited by Hudson, who was the owner of Country Life magazine. And Jekyll had written articles for Country Life magazine. So did they work together in this garden? They did work together. Lutyens designed the paths and the beds. Right. He also reduced the wall. OK. He moved the gate from the north wall so that you could come across the field. And then Jekyll, her magic planting touches. She did. Jekyll had studied at art school and used sweeps of colour like brush strokes in her planting plans. Texture was also incredibly important to her, and she often used plants like this stachys. Here it sits in perfect harmony against the grey of the pathways Lutyens designed. How on earth do you end up working somewhere as beautiful as this? It's amazing, isn't it? Beautiful it's here. Be I mean, how did you end up here? I, I came here from Hertfordshire, where I'd been working, and um, I wanted to come back to the area and um, I couldn't find a job and I volunteered in the garden. From there, I've landed this job. Wow, and did you have any gardening experience before that? No, just from garden at home. I trained as a photographer. My background there was portraits with maternity and newborns. Wow! So I had to learn a lot of patience working with newborn babies and it, it comes in handy for this I'm job. I can say, you know, that now makes a tremendous amount of sense. <laughs> Caring, sensitive, loving, capturing moments. And that's exactly what you do in this garden. That's right. This can't be an easy site to go on, can it? What are the challenges? Obviously, being on an island and surrounded by the North Sea, the wind can be a major challenge on this garden. The plants come in when they're very, very young. They're hardened off so that they can withstand the winds when they come into the garden, when they're very young seedlings. And from there, they should be strong enough to grow in these conditions. Have you got any plans to move this garden on? No, we stick to the Jico plan. This was Jico's creation, and all we're doing is keeping her plants as they were and how she created them in her mind because she never ever saw the garden planted. So right. it's, it's lovely for people to see what she had in her, her mind. 
So how come that Ducal never saw it planted up? Ducal was quite elderly when she visited here um, and she only came there once and she lived down in Surrey so it was quite a long way for her to come. I'll say them days. <laughs> <laughs> but what does this garden and your role mean to you now? It's, it's wonderful to create the garden every year. There's always lots of planning involved and it gives great pleasure when people come in and are just stunned by the vibrancy of the colours of the plants. It's all here, That's right. in a nice little envelope, sitting on Holy Island. Couldn't be nicer, could it? Not a day like today. <laughs> Now, it has to be said that not all of Jekyll's planting schemes went so well to plan. Back at the castle, I'm meeting Nick Lewis, the curator of the building, who's going to show me how even a renowned plant woman sometimes got things wrong. I believe you're having problems with this thing. Yeah, this is red valerian, which was um, part of the planting scheme um, carried out by Gertrude Jekyll, and it can cause the, the crag to become unstable. Right. But how on earth was it planted? She was um, not able to reach some places, so she used a shotgun and loaded it with seeds <laughs> and marched around, <laughs> blazing away, yeah. Um, she also used a, a young boy in a wicker basket, which she dangled off the, the batteries here, uh, to the more hard to reach places. But um, this red valerian in particular is, it has caused us some problems recently. And um, when we've been doing surveys of the natural rock crag, which is this thing, yeah. the roots are burrowing their way down into natural crevices. And blasting it. As, as they're opening out, yeah, with, with frost yeah. And, and with ice. And uh, we are getting quite substantial areas where the rock is unstable. It is causing us a, a, a lot of concern. So how do you deal with it? Because we're in a, a particularly significant part of the world, uh, the, the area we're standing in around the castle is a grade two listed park. Right. We have contractors who abseil down okay. and they treat individual plants with right. just a, an off-the-shelf weed killer. Yeah, weed killer. Um, right. And that happens every sort of four or five years. Right. Um, and it's a way of keeping it down, but also it allows this to stay as a feature and be true to what Gertrude intended. Yeah. Uh, even though it is causing us a problem, we try and balance the two. Shooting seeds into the rock was a bit eccentric, but there's now a technique for spreading seeds that's not a million miles away from Jekyll's shotgun method. It's called hydro seeding. A mixture of earth and seed is sprayed onto steep slopes like this one. It's really come into its own on the site close to Newcastle. This amazing woman is Northumberlandia. In 2010, the owners of this open cast coal mine commissioned landscape architect Charles Jenks to design a public park, making use of the earth dug out to create the mine. She's the biggest woman in the world, seven times the size of a football pitch. She's now looked after by the Land Trust and the Northumberland Wildlife Trust. And Dan is one of their wildlife rangers. Northumberland is a, an art park, it's a reclining human figure, it's a, a lady lying on her back and in a point in one way and offering an open, open hand of friendship and welcome with, with her left hand. The lady was created with spoil from the surface mine, there's a million and a half tonnes that have gone into the landform, which was created with 900 millimetre high stone blocks and then covered with topsoil to create the gradients and the slopes and then blasted with uh, grass seed and, and some wildflowers as well. The grassy banks aren't the only feature that Dan and his team look after. Northumberlandia is surrounded by water and they need to keep these plants in check. They're called typha, or more commonly, bulrushes. Without attention, they can be very invasive. The idea with these ponds around the ladies is that they're reflection ponds, so that on a day like the day you can see the reflection of the landform in the ponds. And pond edge vegetation is good for wildlife, but we need to stop it from spoiling the definition of the pond edges. So we're just taking a little bit of it out today and we'll allow some of it to continue to grow to provide home for invertebrates and other wildlife. Northumberlandia hasn't just regenerated the countryside. She's changed the lives of some people who work here. 
Wayne started here as a volunteer and is now an assistant ranger. I'm the site warden and I meet and greet the visitors and give them information about the site and about Northumberlandia. Check that everything's okay and that's clean and tidy for visitors. I came here as a volunteer but ended up with a full-time job. And just meeting different people every day is just fantastic. As well as maintaining the ponds, the whole site is maintained with the idea of keeping nature in balance. We don't carry out a lot of manicuring kind of work and cutting grass. Um, the grass on the ladies cut once a year in July in the surrounding areas with managers a meadow, so that's cut later in the season, kind of middle of August. Um, so again, you get invertebrates on the wildflowers and then bird species associated, with, and that kind of keeps the interest, the wildlife interest of the site going. It's not only animals and birds that enjoy the site. It's estimated that in 2012, the year she opened, 100,000 people came to walk on Northumberlandia and enjoy these spectacular views. The vast majority of visitors are absolutely astounded by the place, especially when you see the landform from the first time um, and, and kind of have a walk round. It's, it's, it's got its own atmosphere. It's a really unique place, and most people seem to appreciate that really well. I'm finishing my trip to Northumberland at Cragside. It's a unique place with links to the industry of the North East, created by Victorian engineering genius, Lord Armstrong. I want to leave a souvenir of my visit with the fantastic people who look after this place. Estate workers and their friends and family have gathered in the formal garden to see the artwork I've had made by the artist and blacksmith, Stephen Lunn, to celebrate Cragside. I've asked Jennifer, who told me about her volunteering here, to accept it on behalf of them all. Do you know what's been really nice about today? Is how much Armstrong is alive and kicking in this garden. And as a, a little gesture, as a tribute, just to show the influence this man has had on gardens in the county, we thought that we might like to leave you just a little tribute to the genius of the man. Now, created by a local blacksmith, and the curves are to represent the turbines, the swish and flow of water, and the sparks of hydroelectricity. Wow. So, Armstrong, alive and kicking, sitting amongst his countryside in his garden. So I hope for many, many years to come, you'll look at this and remember a truly amazing bloke. So what do you think, Jen? I think it's absolutely amazing. Splendid, I've had a lovely day. So thank you all very much. This work of craftsmanship will stay here in the formal garden a great reminder of a man who dreamed of energy generated from water. It's time for me to leave Northumberland, but I'm taking away with me fabulous memories of people who have had a dream and made it come true. They've created tiny gardens and huge landscapes. They've found medicine in plants and power in water. And all in a part of the country with views as spectacular as its achievements.